Great. Well, thanks, Tracy, and um, welcome to everyone. Thanks for turning up, and um, I hope what I tell you is going to be of some interest. Um, as Tracy said, I'm a, I'm an editor at PLOS Biology. Um, I've been there for 12 years or so, since 2011, when I moved from academia. Um, when I was an academic, I had never heard of meta-research, um, uh, so it's been a, a journey for me. Um, and meta-research itself has grown as a field in that time. I think it's in a place that even those who knew about it back then would never have imagined. Um, and uh, it, it's grown not only in the volume of work that's being done, but also in, in the, the audience that it reaches, the recognition and the impact that it has. So originally I was a human geneticist um, and I mostly handle uh, ecology and evolutionary bi biology and human and uh, behavior um, for PLOS biology, um, but I also uh, handle uh, most of the meta research submissions. Um, and uh, we, we are now um, as a journal, um, I've put some details there, but essentially what you need to know, looking at the stuff that I'm going to be presenting, because most of it will be from the corpus that we've both considered and published, is that we're highly selective. So we're we're looking for the, the top end of stuff, stuff that we think is going to be of broad interest to our readers. And at the end, I'll, I'll catch up on what we're, we actually look for. Um, we're a non-profit company. Um, and we plough back any surplus that we have into um, trying to uh, various initiatives that are trying to improve the, um, uh, the the scholarly publication landscape. We're broad scope across all of biology, um, and we're open access. And in fact, our our founding twenty years ago was um, to try and push forward the open access cause. Um, so we first launched um, almost exactly twenty years ago in in two thousand and three. We published our first official meta-research article um, in, at the beginning of 2016. And since then, we've published 61 uh, meta-research articles, which are really of quite amazing quality and have been highly influential. If you look at the number of citations um, and the number of, 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 um, of page views as two sort of orthogonal uh, assessments of the interest, they, they have clearly garnered quite a bit of um uh, interest in the in among the readership. Um, so, <clears throat> how do we define meta research? I'm sure you've you've been given a definition of meta research, and I think we all have one. We're always trying to sort of um, shoehorn articles into the meta research bracket. We're often trying to make the call of, uh, as to whether something is meta research or is it just straight research or is it something more conjectural than that. The broadest definition, I guess, is research about research, but actually we 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 also consider things either side. So research about researchers, the people who are actually doing the research, about the dissemination of that research, and also about the impact that that research has, what that research is used for, which may not necessarily be for further research, but maybe for other things. And always among the team, there's quite a bit of uh, debate about whether something constitutes meta-research or not. And there's a lot of papers that um that could be pushed into either category they are there's a they they are at the base they are re they appear to be research but actually their, their their implications are for meta research that their their biological implications are relatively trivial but their meta research um, implications are more substantial um and in fact it's these considerations of these grey areas and the distinction between meta research and and regular research with the biological impact that led us to um, to to create this special article type, the meta research article, back in twenty sixteen. I'll, I'll return to that at the end. So, if we consider the research process as a, as a cyclic as a, um, um, phenomenon. And I think when I this first became apparent to me, it, 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 in retrospect, it seems obvious, but it became apparent to me when I was writing an editorial, looking back on um, our, um, our meta research articles, and they very clearly spontaneously formed this circle. So um, um, you start off from before anyone's done any work, you start off from a research community, a global research community that has a certain composition in, and, and a certain set of behaviors. So they, they are 
they have they have genders they have ethnicities they are they are based in different uh, uh geographical locations they are from different sectors so they're in the private sector they're in academia um and um, they're in government um, bodies um so they they're very diverse and the way that they differ from each other can uh influence the science they produce and um and also as we'll see the science that is produced can influence that composition and behavior as part of the cycle. That in turn leads to research, the choice of research topic. So the choice of research topic is driven by the members of the community. It's also driven by a set of research prioritizations, which is um, exerted from above by funding preferences of funding bodies, um, things that they encounter themselves uh, in the literature and various other pressures which constrain scientists to research a particular set of topics. Once you've decided on a topic there are different ways of, de of designing that and a lot of our, the papers that we published actually focus on uh, design and methodology. How, how is that best done? How is that done not so well how is it done out there if you take a cross-section of the papers out there how is research designed uh, how good is it uh, what are the problems and how can we improve that also closely tied into that is the way that those results are interpreted and described so the way that they are reported in papers how reproducible that description is um, and how their interpretation of the results given the design study is also shaped by that composition of the researchers, their agenda, and what they are trying to look for. And what can we do to improve that description to enhance transparency and reproducibility of research? This is where we st step in. This is the, the, the bit that absolutely pertains to a, a journal like us we are people who are the the funnel through which all of this work has to pass before it is published and then disseminated so we're part of the selection process we are quite capable of introducing our own biases by saying yes we want to publish cool stuff and if it's a little boring or is just a, a replication study, just in inverted commas, a replication study, then um, uh, maybe we will tell it to go elsewhere. Uh, maybe it will never be published because the incentive for the author is, is not so great to publish it. So there are a whole load of biases that come in there. Dissemination of results doesn't end with publication. We are also... Um, uh, interested in what happens afterwards. So there are things like the way it's covered in the press, the way uh, other people receive it, discover it, and read it, uh, the way that it's described in social media. Um, and finally, those results, those findings and the papers and where those papers are published have knock-on effects for the assessment of the researchers that we talked about right at the beginning of that um, cycle. So, so they're often, the, the, the perceived importance of those results often then goes into the immediate assessment of the researchers and the funding decisions that then de determine whether they can carry on working on what they're working or can determine what they will be working on in future. Um, and it's not only the, the findings themselves, of course, but which journal they are published in um, and uh, merely publishing journal A rather than journal B can determine the how research then progresses and the direction it takes. Um, so that's the cycle and we all of that we consider to fall under meta research and I think I have examples of all of those, possibly a couple of examples for each one, which I'll run through um, next. Um, now they are all, you will spot, drawn from my journal, and partly because it's an easier task for me and I know these things inside out, and partly because I think they're actually quite good and quite interesting. Um, and I will only cover them very briefly um, but I, on each page, you will see a QR code. And if you're particularly interested in that paper, you can just snap the QR code and 
go and read the paper yourself in your spare time. The of these 61 papers, which I, I looked at, I surveyed, these are the, I pulled out the methods and I put them into uh, a word cloud and you can see various things coming out. This is a highly skewed set, I would say. I think it's there is a high preponderance of papers on aspects of preclinical research. And I think that's because of the, the history of this field. Um, but uh, but there's quite a diversity. So literature, so there's a lot of literature, literature research of varying degrees of rigor and meta-analysis, a lot of bibliometry. So looking at the citation structures. Um, uh, there are wet lab experiments, which are used to address meta-research questions. Um, there are also, uh, there's modeling, the simulations, um, interviews, um, and then there are uh, there are very specialized databases. Also, there's genetic database, sequence analysis, um, social media databases. There's academic family tree was used for one study, um, and various sets of documents that were um, mined, text mined to do these studies. So there's a diversity of data and a diversity of methods that we used to um, to comb through that data and to analyze it. Um, so there's a huge number of topics. Most of, uh, I would say over half of them will, uh, the findings are generalizable across all fields of biology, certainly and possibly wider than biology. But some are field specific. I've just listed some of those fields there, human genetics, biodiversity, microbiome, cognitive neuroscience. Um, so they're I suspect that's one paper for each of those, and then the remainder are, are more generalizable. But you can get the idea of the, the range of material that we've we've looked at. I think for meta research, we have a publication rate, which is much higher than the rest of the journal. We publish about 10% of what we receive, but in meta research, we publish more like 30%. So my understanding is not that we're softer on meta research, but that we're getting better submissions um, on, on the whole. They tend to be more rigorously done and uh, of greater interest. So maybe that's because it's a young field and still very vibrant. Um, so as well as topics, there's also a diversity of issues. So these are the, the issues that whatever the topic of the particular study, these are issues that emerge from it and are addressed by the paper and um, cut across a lot of um, aspects. So gender, language, as in the language of researchers, what languages they speak and, and can read, training, mentorship, equity, prioritization of research, transparency, transparency and reproducibility of research, bias that's introduced at various levels in that circle that I described, various things like um, pre-registration and appropriate choice of statistical methodology that can try and um, reduce those problems. Things like the three R's and consideration of um, animal uh, ethics in animal studies, um, aspects of peer review, spin, as in spin in papers and spin in um, uh, post-publication dissemination of uh, research in the press and in social media. Um, also science communication, social media, and then evaluation and funding of scientists in the final bit of that cycle. So I've picked 12 out of that 61. Um, I'm going to keep an eye on the clock so that I don't get um, too interested in some of the papers, but I'm hoping that um, I will be able to describe the papers in a couple of sentences in a way which will tell you whether you can, whether you're interested in looking at it in more depth afterwards. And I've, I've chosen these specifically, well, partly because I think they're all intriguing, but also they're diverse in terms of the topic, the issue, and the methodology that's being used to um, get those um, answers. Um, so this is <clears throat> one which is looking at um, the gender gap in science. So what they did here <clears throat> was to uh, survey millions, I think it was, I can't remember, several millions of, um, of papers and the authors of them. And they developed a method 
for inferring the gender from their name and their geographical location. Um, and they they verified that to check how accurate it was. Um, and that is part of the advance. And the rest of the advance is applying that methodology to look at not only uh, the existing uh, gender biases by field by field, but also the trends through time of that so that they can see in different fields at what point in the future, given current trends, will um, men and women be equally represented in those fields? I think that's quite a cool study. This is one that we published just this year. It is, I think, our high, most highly viewed paper of this year so far, and um, really ran and ran on social media. Um, and this the, so the met this is a, a questionnaire based meta research paper so they sent out a questionnaire to 900 or so researchers with varying degrees of proficiency proficiency in english and uh, asked them uh, to try and quantify the costs to them at each in each part of their professional career that they had incurred by not having english as their first language um, the authors themselves are also very diverse linguistically, and they've actually also taken care to produce uh, translations of their abstract in many different languages, which are available as part of the supplement. Um, so what I guess the idea is no one is surprised that there is a, a, a and in fact, this is, a, this is a, a recurrent theme in meta research. I think a lot of these papers, you would say, well, no one's surprised that women are, um, taking a, a while to reach um, uh, equality with men, particularly in senior positions. No one is surprised that there is a cost to not uh, speaking English as your first language in a field that for strange historical reasons is dominated by English. Um, but in each case, we're quantifying the problem. We're giving people a benchmark by which people can take action. And that's another, uh, interesting thing about these meta research articles is they're often not only spotting the problem and quantifying the problem, but they are also um, proposing uh, solutions. And in fact, if people don't propose solutions, we tend to try and push them uh, in their revision to, to propose some solutions that can be assessed by the peer reviewers for how feasible they are. This is one, <clears throat> moving around that circle, this is one about research priorities. What determines whether you study something or not? Now, this is quite a nebulous question to address, but what these people have done is to take one situation where the problem is not nebulous, the list of human genes. So we have about 20,000 human genes, and it's very easy to tell because every single one has a very clear searchable name. It's very easy to tell which of those have been studied, how much they've been studied by using bibliometry, and also to try and look at the properties of those genes and the proteins that they encode and see if there are reasons why certain genes are being ignored. And also from the genes that have been shown to be important, can we predict genes that have been ignored so far, which might be important and therefore deserve prioritizing for future um, research. Again, quite a cool use of combined um, genetic database mining and bibliometry. This is another one of those things that no one is going to be surprised by the result of this, but it's something that needs benchmarking so that we can go to funding bodies and say, look, there's a real problem here um, and it needs sorting. So what they've done here is to go through half a million human microbiome data sets and find out where they came from, essentially. And the answer is in that bottom graph that you can see there, the disparity between the number of samples in the main graph and the distribution of those ethnicities in the bar on the right. Um, and you can see there, surprise, surprise, that Europe and North America dominate, even though they're a tiny proportion of the global population. This is clearly a problem in terms of using those data in any meaningful way across the global population and um, and is therefore of interest to 
funding bodies and people who want to make generalized statements about the relationship between microbiome structure and issues of human health and so forth. And that was done using uh, gene database mining, um, specifically microbiome data sets. Um, this is a paper, we've got several papers on, on this uh, topic where you're trying to look at the relationship between how preclinical um, animal research is done and how reliable and reproducible the results are. Um, this particular one um, doesn't use any wet, new wet lab um, experiments. Some of, some of them do. I think there's three or four that use um, wet lab experiments, which are set up specifically to address meta research questions. This one they're using prior published data sets from different um, uh, animal research uh, projects. And they're using those that, from the meta-analysis to, to as an input for simulations to see how the uh, reliability, re reproducibility of the results depends on how the, um, how the study was structured, whether it involves um, multiple labs or single labs and how much heterogeneity is built into the system. And this is another simulation based thing. This is this is purely running simulations and asking the question, if you shift from using just a single sex uh, animal study, usually by default, the males, and you then double up and 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 introduce females and use a single um, single study, but uh, both sexes, um, do you have to automatically increase your sample number? Uh, in order to uh, to maintain the same statistical power. So these authors use simulation to uh, to test that. And the answer is no, you don't by default. There are conditions where it, it might help to increase sample number, but actually you get ad additional information and no loss of information by switching from a single sex to a, um, a both sex study. And this is what this this is asking what methods, what statistical, mostly statistical methods. <clears throat> you can see, I don't know if you can read the, the labels on each graph. Some of those are rather traditional, so null hypothesis testing, ANOVA, and things like that, then getting perhaps more and more cool and trendy, ending up with machine learning classifiers and things like that. So you are uh, it's a, a whole slew of different methods from the more traditional to the more cutting edge. And what they do here is essentially use bibliometry and machine learning. The machine learning is to extract the, um, the methods um, out of the uh, raw XML text of the papers and looking at trends um, and, and essentially seeing which of these methods is going down over time and which is going up over time. And as you can see there, this is a study that itself uses machine learning um, and machine learning is going up through the roof at the bottom right hand corner. And the, the purpose of this is not just to say these are the methods that are being used, it's to try and shape the future education of scientists who we can see which way the, the methods are going. Those are the methods you might want to educate your students in to build the next generation of scientists so that they're able to use these cutting edge tools. Um, and this is this is one about us. This is about um, about journals and how uh, things differ between journals. There is a perception of journals that journals with a high impact factor are really good and everything about their process is fantastic. And those with a low impact factor um, are not so great. Um, and this is this is something that's really not been borne out um, in almost any parameter apart from that of per perceived kudos. Um, this is one which, which took um, uh, several uh, tens of thousands of reviews um, from, uh, from a, a, a review platform. So it's a review platform that's used uh, by multiple journals and uh, use machine learning to comb through those to try and classify uh, reviews in terms of their th thoroughness and helpfulness in different sections of the paper that they're addressing and essentially finding how those differ between 
journals with high and low impact factors. And it had interesting, nuanced, and uh, slightly counterintuitive uh, results. Now we're moving on to uh, research dissemination. So the paper has been published. What happens next? Well, one of the things that happens is we move, we we accept a paper for, publica for publication. We then commission a freelancer, usually, to write a press release. We press release it, and it then appears in the media if it's an exciting result. Um, you may, if you're on Twitter, you may have come across um, a uh, a hashtag called just says in mice and just says in mice is uh that this in mice um lobby group uh apply to papers where if a paper is making some or the 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 um uh the the press release and or the journal the newspaper um article is making some grand claims about a paper which was actually in a model organism like mice, for example, um, and is not mentioning the fact that the study was in mice, these people will retweet the, the article with the hashtag just says in mice. What they're doing here is looking for the relationship between the title of the paper, the title of the press release, and the headline that's used in the newspaper and seeing how they relate to each other. If a paper is in, you know, in this case, they're looking at Alzheimer's studies, but it's a broader survey or with broader implications. If the paper says X, Y, Z reduces the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, but fails to say in mice in the title, what these people show is that this also tends to feed through to the press release and ultimately to the headlines in the newspapers. And they would say that that is somewhat misleading. And as a result, in fact, of publishing this paper, we have since ensured that any titles are changed to reflect the, the study species. Um, and they use their, they use literature, uh, literature search with manual coding, in fact, which is probably the most popular set of methods in any of our uh, meta research articles. There's also social media. This is an interesting study, which it doesn't use um, published papers or peer reviewed papers, but use bioarchive um, uh, preprints. And what they did was to look at, um, uh, I think this was a couple of hundred thousand preprints, so that's uh, um, social media posts about preprints from a range of topics. Um, they did several things. Firstly, they they looked at the tweets that relate to those preprints. So these are often very um, most preprints tend not to be um, mentioned in social media. So this they tend to be, so the ones that they that are mentioned tend to be of unusual, slightly provocative topics. What they do here is to look at the number of tweets um, per article. They then look at the people who are tweeting and retweeting those and form a network and then do autom automated segregation of those networks to see how they cluster and see. And they, they've done this. They do this at several ways. But what you can see in this particular chart is they've done it by field. And you can see that they've then clustered them and then also using um, the biography, the profile terms in the Twitter users um, biography to then segregate those individuals on a political left to right ratio. And there are various things that you can see a lot of genetics and neuroscience being tweeted quite potentially with misleading um, purposes uh, on the, the right wing. And they give various examples of this. And then a lot of soft things like science communication and education in ecology coming out on the left wing, but very interesting use of social media data and um, automated network analysis. And now we're on to research evaluation. So the research is out there, everyone's talked about it. What is it used for? This is looking at um, how people might acquire funding, how funding decisions are made. And at the moment, it's a straightforward 
it's the left hand thing here. You have a a uh, a competition. People put in proposals. They invest a lot of time, and there is a competition for essentially by which they are judged. And the, what they're doing here is what happens if, as well as doing that, you do a partial lottery. So some of your judgments are made on that basis, on the traditional basis of a competition between proposals, and some of it is done by lottery. And lotteries, they are random, but they also reduce the burden on the research community, both in terms of putting in your application and in, in terms of judging it and reviewing it. That is one of our most views and mo most viewed and most cited um, meta research papers ever and uses modeling. Um, and then uh, the final paper I want to talk about is one which is looking at uh, uh, citation rates, but trying to repurpose those. And in fact, these are people who worked at the NIH, and we've considered a few more papers since then that use this relative citation ratio, the RCR, and using that, normalizing it uh, by field, using network analysis to look at um, uh, shared overlapping interests, and you then normalize your citation rate by those around you in the in the space, in expertise space. Um, and this gives you a more across field because fields behave very differently. They have very different citation behaviors. This gives you a way of normalizing those so that you can judge between very disparate fields, the relative uh, citation rate of those individuals. And not forgetting these, these are two papers um, which uh, have come from the Quest Center and which have also attracted a lot of attention and uh, both fall into the bracket of being very good in terms of not only uh, quantifying the problem, but also offering solutions. And in fact, a lot of the reasons that people have, have been very interested in these in social media is because of the solutions that are offered as well, nice structured um, proposals of the way that things can be improved. So I'm just over the half hour. I am, uh, those are, these are questions that Tracy sent to me. Um, I think I've addressed the first one. The second one, so what we tend to do, they, those two uh, aspects are handled by different people, whether meta research study is impactful is essentially my call um, in collaboration with one of our academic editors. Whether it's rigorously conducted is a job for the reviewers. And so our, our, the question we tend to ask ourselves when I'm looking at a paper that's come to me, it's the first time I've looked at it, and really we're asking, how interesting is this? Is, is this uh, you know, going to be of, of interest to a wide number of people? Um, is it done in an intriguing and creative way? Is it some a new approach, a new set of data that someone's decided to leverage to ask a very interesting question? I will also try and find out whether it's new, whether someone else has tried to do it before and whether this attempt is better. I'll then, if the answer to those is yes, it looks interesting and yes, I think it's new, I'll then discuss it with an academic editor who's a member of our editorial board and I'll check in with them and they'll say, yeah, I think this is interesting, but I'm afraid it's been done before. It's not so, I saw a paper like this last year. It's possibly not so new. So maybe we, we will forget about it. Or they might say, yes, this is great. I did, I'm not aware of anything else. Let's send it out to the reviewers and see if it's rigorous. So I'm asking the question, is it interesting if true? And the re reviewers are telling me whether it's true or not, whether the findings support the um, the, the conclusions. I think the next question is really interesting. Um, why did we start this this collection? It's not just a collection; it's a it's a it's a whole uh, article type. Um, and I think so. Th so this started before I started to do them. So I um, I was handling one or two. They were meta. They were what we would now say as down the line meta research articles. But we didn't have an article type, so we considered them as research articles alongside papers that had a straightforward biological advance. And that caused various difficulties. Um, and the, the you know, we used to have to try and ask ourselves questions. How, they, 
especially where the paper itself has no biological advance at all. It doesn't tell us anything new about the biology, but it does have implications at the meta research level for how we do research. Um, and so it was partly because of that, we felt a need to try, we were seeing more of these papers, we felt a need to try and um, carve those papers off into a se separate section so we could judge them properly in their own right. And the other is that we were joined a, an ex-colleague of mine, um, Stavruna Kusta, who came from an experimental psychology background. And experimental psychology has a, a is historically um, um, somewhat ahead of many other fields in terms of meta-research, partly because of the problems that they have had in their own field. That it, there have been issues of poor reproducibility and um, inappropriate uh, methodology and things like that. So they've they've had a history of problems. They've thought out a lot of these. The um, registered reports or pre-registration has come from that field. And Stavrula came and perceived this need and set up those um, articles. She's now moved on to another journal, but I'm now uh, handling them. And I think um, we also have a section of our editorial board who who are dedicated to handling these papers. And I think that it has there been a couple of times during this talk where I've said this made us change the way that we see things. It made us change our publication um, practices as well. Um, and I think they've had a direct influence on us. And I think certainly from the number of citations and uh, and page views, they have been very highly impactful. What advice would I give to aspiring meta researchers? Um, I think the most interesting papers that I've seen have come, and this probably applies outside meta research um, too. So that is basically asking an interesting question, and secondly, leveraging a, an interesting or unexpected source of data, a rich source of data that can be used to address that question. And I think some of our most intriguing and most highly uh, received papers have fallen into that bracket, where it's a new, new, a new repurposing, often of existing data, um, for a, to to address a, a, a new question. Um, so I, I think I'm going to finish there and open the floor up to see if any of you guys have any further questions. <laughs>